Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8. But before we turn there to study God's Word, as a matter of information, I want to let you know that it is the plan of the church to begin assembling in person again next Sunday, February 7th. We want to provide that option, Lord willing. Uh, there are going to be three options next week. You can join us in person at 11 o'clock, or you can join us across the road or in the parking lot in close proximity proximity. Uh, we'll have a, a radio station frequency for those who would like to participate outside of the service. You'll be able to do that on site at 11 o'clock. And then next Sunday, a little bit later in the day, uh, beginning Sunday afternoon, we'll have available that morning's message. We hope you can join us in one of those three ways. Again, it's contingent upon everything moving in a good direction toward that. Please keep in touch with us through our church website for any last minute uh, changes or feel free to call me at any time if there are any questions. But our goal, again, is to meet next week. We're looking at Exodus 17 and verse 8 again. And before we look, I want to spend a time in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can study intercessory prayer this morning. What a privilege it is, Lord, to see you, to experience you working through the ministry of prayer on behalf of others and to do it through us. Lord, impress upon us the effectiveness of intercessory prayer. And Lord, as a result of this study, may we commit and resolve, Lord, to be intercessors, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 8 of Exodus 17, it says, At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, Select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that Moses' hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. The Lord then said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Indeed, my hand is lifted up toward the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation unto generation. You know, all of us have goals and desires and dreams. It's part of being a human being. Some of us, our, our goal would be that we would be able to retire comfortably. For some of us, our, our goal would be this, that we would reach the pinnacle of our profession. Many of us, uh, our goals are really family-related. But you know, as I think about our goals and our dreams and desires, one goal that each of us would have is this, that our lives would make a difference that the difference of our lives would live beyond our existence and would be very broad. I think this heart desire is depicted maybe best in the saying that you've heard that goes like this, don't just make a living, make a difference. One of the great ways that we can make a difference in our church, in our family, in our community, in this nation, and in the world is through the ministry of intercession. In reality, it is God who is making the difference in us and through us. I want to speak today about one of the true gifts of God, the gift of intercessory prayer. We're looking today at three men, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, who made a difference here in Exodus chapter 17. They acted on behalf of Joshua and the fighting men of Israel, and they made a difference. You know, I love the Old Testament narratives. They're so special. I love especially those Old Testament narratives that depict the miraculous hand of God, and we find one here in Exodus chapter 17. The people of Israel were recently freed from bondage in Egypt. But between Egypt and the land God promised to them lay Rephidim. 
Rephidim was north of the Red Sea in the southern Sinai Peninsula. And the scripture tells us here in Exodus chapter 17 that it is there that Israel faces its first post-Exodus challenge. The Amalekites were that challenge. They were descendants of Esau, and they were individuals who jealously guarded the territory that they considered their own. They so jealously guarded it that they didn't wait for Israel to arrive north to them. They took the battle south to Israel. And so here it is at this point that we see a conflict and God demonstrates his power, not just through Joshua and the army, but very important to our message today, we see that he demonstrates his power through Moses, Aaron, and her. You know, God is powerful. And he demonstrates that power in so many ways in our lives. Many of you, you have been praying fervently for loved ones, for church members, and you can attest to the power of God in prayer. But we know that God also demonstrated his power numbers of times in the Bible. I think of the great battles that Israel won, and not just that they won the battles, but the unexplainable way that they won them. Uh, they won battles using crushed pots, uh, a hymn-singing army, circling the city for seven days, among other ways. Individually, God used an insignificant last son of Jesse, a, a, a small stone and a slingshot to drop a great giant. In, in the New Testament, God took a man who was unassuming, that one that we never would think that God could use, a persecutor of the church, Paul, and he used that man in a powerful way to write almost half the books of the New Testament. Even the disciples themselves were described as unimpressive, uneducated men, yet God changed the world through them. God is powerful. And we are blessed to, to know that as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, he can demonstrate that power in and through us. The power is from him, but we can be instruments that, that God uses. Today we see a willing army and a towering saint. And God uses both to demonstrate his power against the Amalekites. I want to look specifically at Moses and the action on the hill. Can you imagine how Joshua felt when Moses said, look, Joshua, you're going to go down there and fight. And by the way, we're going to be up on the hill. I'm sure Joshua was saying, sure, why don't you come down and fight with me? But as we study this passage, we understand that what Moses is doing on the hill is equally as significant what Joshua is doing in the valley. Moses, Aaron, and Hur were instruments God was using. And they're a picture to us of the ministry of intercession. You might ask how. Well, they bore not a single arm, yet they were integral in Israel's victory. They were not engaged physically in battle, yet they were engaged. They served Joshua and, men, and the men from a distance. And that's exactly what intercessors are called to do. To make sense of Exodus 17 and how God is working here, there are four quick things that we need to apprehend that, that again, are integral. First, we see the two venues. There's the hill, and there's the valley. We see the two groups, Moses, Aaron, and Hur on the hill, Joshua, and the fighting men in the valley. And then there are the two activities. Moses, with the help of Aaron and her, lifting up his hands to God on the hill. And Joshua and the fighting men engaged in conflict in the valley. The final point, the fourth point, is this. We see the correlation between the two venues, the two groups, and the two activities. We see a direct correlation. When Moses, who was on the hill, was lifting his hands, Joshua and the men were advancing victoriously and aggressively. When Moses' hands fell, Joshua and the men were retreating at the hands of the Amalekites. And the point that we need to understand as we look at this narrative is this, the direct correlation between what was happening on the hill and what was happening on the valley. Uh, Moses was distinct from those in the valley. The hill was not 
not the valley. The activity was different from that which was going on in the valley. But everything that was happening on the hill had a direct relation to what was happening in the valley. Moses was not there fighting, but he was impacting the battle. Moses was not in the valley, but he was used in the valley. Moses did not swing a single sword, yet God used him to swing the battle. He was not there, yet he was there. And might I add, his work and Aaron's work and hers work is a picture today of the ministry of intercession. In the spirit of a Moses here, an intercessor acts on behalf of another. And in a very real sense, often in the ministry of intercession, that ministry of prayer is from a distance. Intercession is petitioning God on behalf of another. It's one of four parts of prayer. You've heard uh, the A-C-T-S, Acts, uh, in how that depicts prayer. The A is for adoration. The C is for confession. The T is for thanksgiving. The S is for supplication. And how all of prayer generally can be summarized in these four categories. And that last category, supplication, is divided into two parts. Simple petition for ourselves, personal petition. Just like David said, take not your Holy Spirit, Lord, from me in his great confession in the Psalms. But there's also a second aspect of supplication, not just praying for myself, but praying for others. Jesus' priestly prayer in John 17 is an example of that as he began to pray for his disciples both at that time and those who would come after him. And so intercession is that part of the prayer of supplication where we pray not for ourselves but on behalf of others. And God has given us the the privilege of this ministry of intercession. In this prayer, God is able to work through the prayer of intercession to impact others for God's glory. He is able to use us in the answers to those prayers. When an intercessor is praying in the will of God, that one has the blessing of seeing a direct correlation between his and her prayer and its answer. It is a blessed gift, intercessory prayer, but all too often neglected. I want to look briefly this morning at four areas of intercessory prayer in which every believer should be involved. And then in closing, I want to make some brief, important closing remarks about the ministry of intercessory prayer. But first, let's look at the four areas. First, we are called to pray for our nation. We are living in divided times. Everyone has his or her opinion on how our nation should be run. But as Christians, biblically, our responsibility is not to offer our opinion, but we are called to pray for our nation's leaders. Regardless of party affiliation, regardless of personality, regardless of worldview, 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 and 2 gives us this mandate. It says, first of all, that is a priority. I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And so we see here the mandate for general prayers of intercession. But then Paul writes to Timothy specifically for kings and all those who are in authority. In the spirit of a Moses who was lifting up his hand for the nation of Israel here as they were fighting in the valley. In the spirit of a Moses who was praying over Sodom. You and I are called to lift up our prayers to the Lord for our nation. We're called to pray for our nation's leaders. For what are we to pray? We're to pray that their decisions, their policies, their works be righteous. Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And might I add, we are to pray, and this is important, for those who give counsel to our leaders. Every political party thinks the other political party is totally wrong. But I remind you, That as wrong as Pharaoh was, Joseph had his ear. 
As ungodly as Nebuchadnezzar was, Daniel had his ear. Not to mention Esther, who blessed her nation by appealing to the king. Don't ever underestimate the power of praying and how God can, in an unsuspecting, unexpected way, bring people that can have positive influence over our leaders. We're not to complain, we're to pray for our nation. Let me ask you, pray for our nation in these days. Be careful of the trap of being negative or, 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 or allowing your emotions to be controlled in these politically divided days. Focus on prayer and, and trust in prayer. prayer. Pray for our leaders. Pray for their advisors. But there's a second part of intercessory prayer. We're called to pray for our church. I treasure your prayers. I'm appreciative of the many of you who pray for me. I ask you to continue to do so. You say, well, it's selfish to ask that. It's not selfish. It is acknowledging that I'm in need of prayer. You say, what can I pray for you? Pray for wisdom for me as I serve. Pray for my time with God that as I speak and as I preach, I would speak from the outflow of what God is doing in my life. Pray for my purity, purity in life, purity in my motives. Pray that I would lead without fear. This is a wish list that, that you can pray for me as a leader here in this church, but pray for the other leaders in our church. Pray for our deacon leadership. Pray for those who are leading in various aspects of our ministry, those who are involved in impacting our children and youth. Pray that they would be led by God. Pray that revival would come to our church. Pray this, Lord, may we possess a holy unrest. Lord, stir our hearts. Pray God's protection from the evil one over our church, but also pray proactively that we would be impacting our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray that we would support missions that join us in that. Jesus prayed for the church in John chapter 17, and we might follow that example as we intercede on behalf for our church, Concord Baptist Church. But there's a third area. Not just that we call to pray for our nation, to pray for our church, but we're to pray for our families. Some of you, like I, are empty nesters. Your children are no longer in your home. They're at a distance. You're not able to tell them what to do or not to do anymore. You're not there every moment they fall to pick them up or to applaud them when things are going well. Just like Moses in relation to Joshua, there's a distance. Moses was on the hill. They were in the valley. It, yet Moses was able to impact. In one way, as empty nesters, you can impact your children is through prayer. Pray for them. Some of you... In this season of your life, you're called to care for your parents who are aged. Some of you have been limited in your contact with your parents because of this virus. Like Moses, you wish you could be there, but you're at a distance. Through the ministry of intercession, you can impact that aged parent, that loved one. Let me ask you this very simply. If you will not intercede for your family then who would you expect to do so? Now, true, God can use anyone, but I think you receive the point here. Both of Karen's and my sons graduated from Liberty University, and at freshman orientation, the university representative was speaking to the parents, and they shared with us, the university did, a sevenfold prayer for our children. I revisited that this week. I confess it's something while they were in school that I prayed, but I need to reintroduce this aspect of how to pray. There were seven W's that they would walk worthy of the Lord. Do you pray that over your family? That their work would be productive for the Lord. That their wisdom of God would increase. That they would withstand trials and temptation. That their witness would be strong. That their worship would be powerful. We're to pray for our families. But then finally, we're to pray for others generally. That's what Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2. That we're to pray for all people. Do you pray for missionaries? You should. 
If you personally know missionaries, whether they're in this area or whether they're in a foreign mission field, you're to pray for them. Some of you, you have visited nations uh, beyond the United States. And I encourage you, pray when God places, the, if it be Brazil or Honduras or some part in Europe or in Africa, wherever that might be, uh, pray for them. There are six inhabited con continents. You can take one day per week to pray for each one and then have a day of rest from that. Pray for our world cities. More and more people are matriculating to our cities. There are great populations in metropolitan areas around the world are great ways for the gospel to advance. And pray for gospel advancement. If you know missionaries, as I said, pray for them by name. If you don't know for missionaries or know missionaries, please pray. And one pray I, prayer I've just lifted up is, Lord, be with and strengthen and encourage. May your presence be felt by the most discouraged missionary on the foreign mission field today. However you might pray, I would encourage you to pray for missions. If you're not aware of missions for which to pray, you can contact me or our direct missions chairperson, John Parker. We would be more than glad to share with you ministries that we support for which you can pray. Pray for the unsaved. Every one of us should have a list of people written down, written in our hearts for whom we're praying that they would come to know Jesus Christ, family members, co-workers, acquaintances. Stand ready to pray. Pray for our youth, for our children, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand ready to pray for any need. We've been called this week to pray for many people who've been suffering through this virus. Let me encourage you, stand faithful in prayer. Pray for those who are sick. Ask God in regard to intercessory prayer, say, would you, Lord, place someone on my heart today for whom I can pray? Intercessory prayer. It is impacting at a distance, but do not be mistaken. Even though you're not there, your prayer is making a difference. Before we close this morning, I want to note some important points regarding intercessory prayer. Three points very quickly. First, while intercessory prayer is a blessing, never forget it is God who brings the results. Joshua and the army did not bring that victory. They were dependent upon Moses' arm being lifted up. Moses couldn't even lift up his own arm. He was weak. There's no doubt God brought the victory. In fact, he even promised future victory that would later follow in the 8th century B.C. When in verse 14 he says, I'll completely blot out the memory of Amalek. While it is a blessing to be involved in the prayer of intercession, we are merely servants in that. It is God who receives the glory and the answers to that prayer as he demonstrates his power. Secondly, we must have faith in the effectiveness of intercessory prayer. Lord, strengthen our faith that, God, you can use us to impact others, to, to soften your heart that we might be able to make a difference in our families, in our community, our nation, and in our world. May we be convicted and convinced of the truth that God uses intercessory prayer. But then a third thing, if we're to be effective intercessors, we must be in close communion with God. You see, Moses could be at a distance from Joshua and have an impact but he could not spiritually be at a distance from God and have an impact. When we know God, when we're close to God, when we're walking in obedience to God, then we are more effective in this ministry of intercession. I like what Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers, once said. He said, the prayer that gets to heaven is the prayer that begins in heaven. What it means is this, when we know God, when we know the heart of God, then we begin to pray in the way God desires that we pray. Who brought the victory that day at Rephidim? There's no doubt God did. But what a blessing it was for Moses to see the effectiveness of interceding on behalf of someone else. At the close of this passage, 
the Lord was teaching Moses here. And he told him to remind Joshua of this, of what God had done, of everything that went on in the hill and how that related to the valley. And he also there said that he would blot out Amalek. But the scripture says after that, Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. I thought about that word banner, and the first thing I'll admit that came to my mind is that thing that high school football teams run through before a game. But that's not what it's speaking about there, not something that could be shred or torn. But a banner was that to which those in conflict ran toward for strength. And that's what we do in intercessory prayer. It's when we say, God, I can't do it for that person. That person can't do it, but God, I appeal to you. God, you would impact that person. That's the blessing of intercessory prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again today for this gift of intercessory prayer that we can pray for the salvation of individuals. We can pray for protection over our family, for our nation. We can pray for our church. Lord, we have the opportunity to pray for the sick, for individuals in our community that are in financial need. Lord, help us to be answers to those prayers, but Lord, also help us to be prayers that, Lord, your name would be glorified through the ministry of intercession. Father, we love you. Lord, strengthen us, convince us of the effectiveness of this ministry, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.